Hi, my name is Kunal, and welcome to the Geeks of the Valley podcast, which connects with some of the brightest minds globally who are leading their respective industries today to discuss the hottest upcoming industry trends and how their work is affecting the global economy. This morning, from the Toronto, Canada area, we have the ex-co-founder and CEO of InkMind and recent global director of the Founder Institute. Please welcome Loyal VC's founding partner, Kamal Hassan. Kamal, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. And how are things with you in light of COVID? My life has hardly changed. I used to invest by Zoom before. I invest and manage the portfolio by Zoom today. So I'm traveling less, which is both upsides and downsides. Well, that's quite a unique approach. I mean, most VCs pre-COVID used to, uh, you know, meet entrepreneurs in person. Um, did you have that opportunity back then? Or ever since you started Loyal VC, it's kind of been investing on Zoom? So we're a global fund. We've got investments in 34 countries. Uh, there's no way you're going to visit 34 countries uh, in, 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 in a few month period. So you have to invest by Zoom if you're going to be global to that degree. Right. And um, let's kind of jump into the first question here, shall we? Yes. Tell me about yourself and your background and how it led you to the path of becoming a founding partner of Loyal VC. So Loyal VC is based on an idea I've been working on for over 20 years. But my initial background was I started off studying engineering physics, worked as a research scientist with IMAX the movie people, did my MBA at INSEAD, worked at Bain & Company as a management consultant. The last case I did at Bain & Company was actually looking at microfinance, and I took part in the world's first microcredit summit. But ever since that period, I've been really fascinated with how do non-wealthy entrepreneurs get their start in life? Um, so that's been sort of a, a thing in the background. I then went on to become an entrepreneur myself, and I've been an entrepreneur with various businesses for over 20 years, uh, starting with travel publishing in Lithuania and moving on from there. Uh, I've been an angel investor for about 15 years. Uh, I've been uh, running an accelerator program and actually designing accelerator programs for the Founder Institute for a period of about six or seven years and really loyal VC was the bringing everything together from the microfinance to the entrepreneur. As an entrepreneur, you can see as both an entrepreneur and as an angel investor, you can see opportunities, ways you wish venture capital funds operated, things you wish they did. And uh, my partner, Michael Kosick and I, um, who both have similar experiences, I just turned around one day and we were, were meeting up and we realized that, you know, the, the problems we think we've identified in venture capital, maybe call it the opportunities we've identified, seem very, very overlapping. And they're pretty common things that most entrepreneurs will see in venture capital. Uh, what was really amazing for us is that the solutions we independently came up with were about an 85% overlap. So we uh, basically said, you know, we're, if we're crazy, we're both crazy the same way, let's do this. And we launched Loyal VC about three years ago and uh, started investing about two years ago. I wanted to sit and touch on this point that you'd mentioned earlier, right? Non-wealthy startup founders getting their start. So what is it that you found with that? Well, every program you find out there in the world right now is a micro lending program. And micro lending uh, programs are basically a loan is a good way to finance a low risk business. If you're buying a cow and selling the milk, if you're buying a sewing machine and selling the clothes, that is perfectly fine as a business to finance via debt. When it comes to real innovation, well, innovation implies risk and risk implies that the debt may not be paid back. And that doesn't really work well as a something to finance via a loan. Uh, so one is, so basically when you look at it, you say you need some sort of micro, uh, micro equity, micro venture capital product available for people. But the reason people use debt and the reason why micro, micro lending is so common is because debt is cheap and easy to administer. 
So 20 years when I looked at this, I said, okay, great, we need to find a way to make equity investing as cheap and easy to, to administer and scale as uh, lending. Uh, but back then, the information technology tools weren't available. Nowadays, information is so cheap and easy to manage that you can actually design more complex products, which leverage the fact that information is very cheap and easy to gather, analyze, and use. Now, taking a you know, step away into kind of the fund, right? What is the fund's investment philosophy? So we are really trying to take the bias out of VC investing and more, more generally to take the bad decision making out. So one of the things which has frustrated us as entrepreneurs is having venture capitalists say no to, and, and you can talk with all, all sorts of entrepreneurs and you can hear venture capitalists saying no to businesses not because they shouldn't say no to that business, but because they didn't understand it. And you hear over and over from entrepreneurs that VCs just don't get my business. Um, so really what we wanted to try to look at is what does a good decision process look like? How can we take the bias out? And I mean, you can see bias existing in venture capital and just another, a single simple stat, which is 3% of venture capital dollars go to companies with a woman CEO. Now, there is no way you can convince me that entrepreneurial talent is distributed 97% to men and 3% to women. So very clearly, there's some sort of bias and problems in how VCs make decisions. And we wanted to try to make sure we overcame those. And by the way, I noticed these. And one thing I still remember as an entrepreneur is I remember a VC falling asleep during my pitch. And I thought, oh my goodness, how rude. And then three years later, I ended up sitting on a judging panel for a, a group of entrepreneurs pitching to me. And I found myself falling asleep during the eighth pitch in a row. And I just sort of realized, hold on, this, it, this is something about the process, the way things are done. It's not that the VCs are bad, malicious, unintelligent, etc. They're really smart, intelligent people. It's the, the process that we're putting people through with this pitch, which really pitching itself screams bias, asking people to review a hundred companies and pick one, you're guaranteed to get bias in that process. So we've come up with a process which involves a really long getting to know you phase where we talk monthly to companies over a six, eight, 10, 12 month period getting to know them, really understanding their business, and they get a chance to know us. And we use that as a sort of, we make a very small investment to start our stage one investment. And then we get to know the companies and the stories in depth before we make really good stage two decisions. So our belief is that you can judge an entrepreneur by what they do with their business. And in fact, this is something I learned from the Founder Institute Accelerator. Founder Institute does personality testing on entrepreneurs who come in to try to weed out people who are almost certain to fail. So for instance, if you always make excuses for why work isn't done and blame other people, and I'm sure you might've worked with someone like that at some point in your career, um, that sort of person will not succeed as an entrepreneur, uh, save them the pain. But once you take do that, Founder Institute will start a program with 50 entrepreneurs of whom maybe 10 or 12 will fundamentally build a business out the other end. And I've learned through Founder Institute that sometimes the entrepreneurs you think will succeed are the ones that will. But then there's the other time where there's this Russian woman, recent immigrant to Canada, uh, uh, really uh, trying to build software which completely uh, sort of rethinks how the large retailers run their operations and you sit there and you listen to her and she says, oh, it is, no, it's not retail software, it's multi-location management software. And it just sounds ridiculous. But you then sit there and you say, okay, well, look, go out and find me a retailer who's interested in having this software, laughing to yourself, believing no retailer will ever say yes. 
And then she comes back with three, re three retailers who want it. And you start going, well, the business sounded crazy. I have no idea what's here. But when you ask her to do something to prove she has customers who want it, she does it. So that's really what we do is we source from, so we learn through Founder Institute and we only source from two locations. We source graduates of the Founder Institute Accelerator Program where we can see four months of their actually developing a business. And we actually then ask the Founder Institute Accelerator directors to recommend companies to us because they've got four months of diligence information. They can send us the best company based on what they think. And I've worked with Founder Institute. I know many of these directors personally. It makes it very easy to do the sourcing. The second place we source from is alumni of the INSEAD Business School. Now, INSEAD is a top, pick your number, three, five, ten, whatever it is, global business school, probably the number one-ish outside the U.S. And uh, we take alumni from that business school, but again, only after they've got four months of running the business where we can talk to mutual contacts who can give us a reference on them. So that's really what we do is we're judging companies based on what they've proven and done. And once a company gets referred to us out of these channels, we really apply a negative filter, which is, do we think it's almost certain this company will fail? And if we can't find a fatal flaw, then we try funding them. And I'll give you one good example. We had a, uh, uh, in back in November of last year, so November of 2019, we were sitting with an entrepreneur who told us the medical establishment does not understand how to treat viral diseases. And normally when you hear that as a VC, you run for the hills. Because when someone says the medical establishment doesn't understand, it normally means they're crazy. Um, but we do have a network of 300 advisors, one of whom happens to be an ICU doctor. We asked him to do some diligence on this company and have a chat with him. And he said, look, what this guy is saying is completely non-conventional. I disagree with it, but I can't prove it wrong. So we said, great, there may be something here. Let's give them a first investment. And our first investment is only $10,000. So we made a $10,000 first investment. And of course, this was November 2019 when he was saying viral diseases don't kill you. The virus causes the immune system to overreact and it's the immune system overreaction which kills you. It causes these things called cytokine storms. And here we are in a COVID period when all of a sudden cytokine storms are on everybody's lips. And of course, that's a company we did a stage two investment in because they've got an ability to develop a test to tell you how sick people with COVID are and hence who needs treatment to what level and who's just fine and can go home. Thank you for that insight, Kamal. Now, when looking at your fund, uh, you call it the Loyal Global Startup Index Fund. What does index mean in venture investing and why take this approach? The math of venture capital is very well known. It is a business of a small number of winners uh, make up for a whole bunch of losers. Most people don't uh, know the exact math and the exact math based on a 20,000 data set from a group called Correlation Ventures was uh, that 65% of VC deals fail, 31% give you between a 1 and a 10x back again, typically about a 3x. And I just stop there for a second. If two thirds of your deals fail and one third give you three, three times your money back, you're going to end up with about your money back. But there was the last 4% of deals, one in every 25 deals, which gives you 10 times your money or more. And in fact, it gets even uh, lower percentage than that. One out of every 250 deals gives you 50 times your money back or more. Now, every VC, now, this is very obvious that, the, that you need to have those small mega winners and then your fund does well. Pretty well, every VC out there has an excuse or a reason for why they are the ones who are going to be able to identify that one in 25 companies 
regularly and every other VC is an idiot and they won't see it. Well, I've just given you industry average numbers. One out of every 25 VC deals, these are deals which are done by smart people who have managed to raise funds, who often have experience in VC running previous funds. One in every 25 of their deals is a home run. So when you say, this is why I'm special, to me, that's not very convincing. And we sat back and we said, well, hold on a second. What if we're no smarter than any other VC? What if our ability to pick is just as good as the average VC? Well, the second you start thinking like that, you start going, well, look, my odds of getting a uh, home run are only one in 25, so I better do a whole bunch of deals to make sure I have enough home runs. And that's really what index investing is about. And by the way, the um, Kaufman Fellows, the, uh, they, used, they had access to AngelList data, and they did an analysis which basically said that index investing at the seed stage, I believe, outperforms 90% or so of uh, people picking deals. And the reason it does, and the, the same thing actually is true in public markets. This is why indices outperform in the public markets is that even in the public markets, it's a small percentage of all deals which give you a thousand X return or more on your money. And if you invest in the market, you're sure to include those. And if you don't invest in the market, you miss the apples, you miss the Amazons, then you really have much lower returns. So you wanna have a very broad investment to be sure you have winners. And the same math works in venture. And that's why we do this index fund where we currently have 125 investments in the portfolio after only two years. So that's, and it's a global index fund. So we've got investments across 34 countries. It's across industries. Our largest industry is FinTech. That's 16% of the portfolio. We have 8% medical, 6% uh, food, ag tech. We have clean tech. We have pets, you name it. It's in our portfolio. And really the goal is to say venture investing, most people look at venture investing as risky. And it is with most funds because most funds invest in a small number of companies because the person running it convinces you that they are the exceptional person who can pick a winner and everyone else is an idiot and can't. Um, so the result is those small funds have very variable returns. When you build a large fund, and by the way, 500 startups are the people who originally did the math. We were inspired by them uh, to look at the math. Um, when you build a large portfolio, returns are very predictable. Now, returns are very predictable. You'll get about a 10, 15, maybe a 20% return, depending which data set you think is right in venture capital. But you can get a very predictable 10 to 15% return from index investing in venture. Now, Kamal, I want to really spend time on this question. As a fund, you take a very unique strategy when it comes to investing by utilizing what many would call a poker strategy. Can you tell us more about this and what the investing analogies are for maybe an ante, an action, or a backdoor? Perfect. Um, so our stage one investment, that $10,000 we put into 125 companies, is exactly like an ante. When you sit down at the poker table, you want to see your cards. To see your cards, you have to pay. And and that's what you pay the ante for. And that's the way we do our investing is we invest in this large number of companies, a small amount of money, which is the ante to get to know the company, to see it in detail. Every month, we then have a chance to take an action. So, that, so it's just like in poker, sort of every, as the cards get revealed month after month, you get a chance to make a decision. Now, the nice thing about the way we invest is we aren't in a, typically aren't in a competitive time situation. Most companies fundraise over short periods and operate over much longer periods. So we can sit there gathering data and we can just hold our bet, hold our bet, hold our bet 
until we see enough that convinces us that this is a great business to get in on. And that's really, and, and that point, we, we will raise significantly and put more money at work. Now we have a multi-stage process. Stage one, $10,000, stage two, $200,000. Once we've raised the cards, we'll then spend time and see how the hand develops further. And then you'll get a chance for your sort of stage three, uh, which is a million dollars in our case, and we continue from there. Now you mentioned the term backdoor. Um, backdoor hands are ones which initially look really bad, but when the cards develop, all of a sudden you get surprised. And the investment I just mentioned into that uh, viral, uh, th th this viral testing company is one which was a backdoor because when we made the investment, nobody was talking about viruses. Viral res research was very much a sort of back alley within the medical community, which was not considered a very hot topic. And I mean, the, the founder of the business we invested in had been working, did his PhD on RNA viruses in the 1970s, and he worked on AIDS for about a, a, over a decade. But um, this wasn't considered a hot topic, but the, the good old back door, I mean, this was a case where COVID came along and something which looked initially like an unexciting hand became very, very powerful. And that's the advantage of small investments in a bunch of companies that you don't know how they'll turn out. And just on that point, one thing I always recommend anyone who's interested in venture to do is to go and read the Bessemer Ventures anti-portfolio. So this is a list of the deals that Bessemer Ventures, perhaps the oldest VC in the, in the world, um, have passed on. Apple, Google, Facebook, eBay, PayPal. These are all deals that they had the opportunity to invest in and they said no to for very good reasons. And one of the things we're very conscious of is the false uh, negative problem in venture. Most people worry about the false positive problem. How do I make sure I don't pick a loser? Well, when you're all worried about don't pick a loser in an industry where it's about the mega winners and that's what pays off, you have to be really more wondering about how does your process avoid filtering out mega winners? How do you avoid saying no to Google, to Apple, to Facebook? And that's the advantage of our very small initial investment is once the company's in the door, we have the insights view on them. And rather than saying, oh, Facebook is going nowhere, look at Friendster, we can actually watch Facebook's metrics develop month in, month out. And we can say, as I said earlier about this, uh, this, this Russian woman with her software for operations for large retailers, we can say, okay, well, she sounds crazy. It looks like there isn't a market. But then when you see, and this is very real data from her, she had, if I remember correctly, 60% of retail employees were signing on and using her software on a daily basis. Now, retail employees are not easy to manage and motivate it, and her software delivered so much value that people were actually using it. But that's the advantage of if you're inside the company, these back doors, these surprising things, these false negatives, which a normal VC would filter out, are things that we actually manage to have an inside view on and be able to jump on them and invest in them when they're working. When speaking of investing, when investing in startups, the typical types of financing rounds are convertible notes, saves being a subset, or preferred equity rounds. And when looking at term sheets, uh, investors look for MFNs, down round slash anti-dilution rights, etc. What type of financing and term sheet structure do you use when investing in a startup? Do you prefer one approach versus another? So we do have a very, very strong preference, and it's a very unusual one. We have a very strong preference for common shares. Now, that is going to blow a lot of people's minds because most of this industry says, why would I ever do common shares? I need protection. I just started off and said, this is a business about the mega winners. 
So you make your money from the mega winners, not from the losers. Over 80% of your money comes from the businesses that do really well. So when investors insist on the protection of preferred shares, on convertible notes, on really having ways they can come back and grab back every penny if the company fails but still sells its patents for $500,000. Um, they're really optimizing their, they're, they're optimizing the peanuts. They're optimizing the 20%. They're not optimizing the 80%. Our view is we really want to be sure to get for the winners to succeed. And the best way to make sure the winners succeed is for everyone's incentives to be aligned. You want to be sure that the founders have an equal chance with the uh, investors and everyone is all working together as a team, trying to get the company growing quickly and smoothly. And this, for instance, so in common shares, of course you would never, I mean, you could, but you, it doesn't make sense to do anti-dilution provisions for some investors and not others. So that's, it only works if it's, if it's for some investors like a preferred shareholder and not for the, the founders um, because the anti-dilution takes money, it takes shares out of the founder's pockets and gives them, I mean, effectively takes them out of the founder's pockets and gives them to the investor with the anti-dilution protection. Um, but things like anti-dilution slow down the growth of a company. The second there's anti-dilution protections in there, one of two things happens. Either the company does very well, the next investor comes along and they either say, I want anti-dilution myself, or they say, we have to negotiate this out. And then you've got an investor with an anti-dilution protection who has to negotiate it out. And this is turned into a multi-party slow financing rather than a faster financing where the entrepreneur can just work on growing their business. The alternate situation is the company's in trouble. They have to raise money at a quarter of the original financing valuation. Well, if you've got anti-dilution, what that means is the founders all of a sudden have lost three quarter and they, they, they've lost a large portion of their shares and they are less motivated and you end up with all these internal fights. So often a company which could be saved by raising more money never actually raises that money because they get locked up in internal fights and a good company in temporary trouble, which could be saved, fails. So our attitude is things like an anti-dilution are just going to give you trouble in later financing. Take it out. Have common shares, everyone working under the same rules, no special benefits for any, any one person. The rules are the same for everyone. If you want a board seat, anyone with more than 10% of the shares has a board seat or 15% of the shares, whatever magic number you want to use, but have a single simple common shareholder agreement and just keep investing with everybody always working together and no future fights on the horizon, which distract you from having the company succeed. That is uh, quite an interesting approach. Uh, many VCs, right? Uh, would not take that as their traditional approach. And uh, thank you no. for explaining that. Yeah, and, and the reason they wouldn't is because they're optimizing the downside. And I think part of the problem is the entrepreneurs don't understand what's going on. I mean, really, and, and I, I didn't say the last secret piece of this formula, the last secret piece of the formula is if you're doing common shares rather than preferred shares, well, common shares are less valuable than preferred shares. So you should see if you can get a 20% discount on the financing. So you've got a 20% lower valuation, but common shares. And this makes so much sense for the entrepreneur because what all these special terms do is they protect the investor. Now you've got an entrepreneur whose life savings and years of their effort are wrapped up in a business. And if that company fails, they have to go get a job to pay the bills. And you've got an investor who should be widely diversified, who doesn't really care if the business succeeds or fails because they're going to make money anyway. And yet what we're doing is we're protecting the person who can afford the loss and we're transferring risk onto the backs of the entrepreneur who is the one who can't afford to lose. And to me, I mean, you can discuss the morality of it, but to me, this is just bad business sense 
because in a negotiation, the entrepreneur should value the protection more than the investors do. And all you need to do is explain things to the entrepreneur and not take advantage of their inexperience the way many investors do by forcing preferred shares on them, by forcing convertible notes on them. They tell them this is the way things are done. No, every negotiation, you can choose freely how to do things and common shares work. Many countries in the world, the UK has this EIS um, government support for funding early stage companies. They insist that for EIS to work, it must be common shares. You've got lots of countries where common shares are the way to go. And for me, there's just, it makes no business sense to shift the risk to the person who can afford it the least, negotiate a better price, and have the risk be shared equally. Truly well said. To wrap up our call with the last question today, what piece of advice would you give to people out there from the journey you've had thus far in life when you look back? One piece of advice which I would give to entrepreneurs is to really not be sucked in by the glamour of entrepreneurship. Um, whether you're an, a, a VC or an entrepreneur, you have to understand that this is a numbers game. It is really no di different than professional gamblers, as we talked about poker players, where you can do everything right in a hand. And you end up losing the hand because a very, very low probability got card got turned as the last card over. So really understand that this is a probability business. If you're an entrepreneur, the odds are against you. Two thirds of venture company funded, venture funded companies will fail. So understand there's a two thirds chance if you're venture capital quality that you will fail and go into it because there is something pushing you to do this business that really it's worth taking that risk of failure and you won't care if you failed because you did something that you meant to do with your life. It just was very meaningful. And of course, if you're an investor, my advice is don't look, I've, I made a, uh, 11 angel investments. One of those 11 investments, I got 30 times my money back. Now, the probability of that is way out of whack. Do I think I'm a genius investor? Honestly, I think I'm lucky. I think I'm a capable investor who got lucky. And I think the advice for investors is don't run around convincing yourself that you're a genius and every other VC is an idiot because your odds will be so much, your results will be way better than the industries. This is an industry of smart, experienced people. Don't try to convince yourself that you can beat everyone else because you're smarter. Play the numbers. Figure out a way to make money by playing the numbers and understand overall how things work out. By the way, I mentioned earlier, um, our stage one investments, the diversification, the industry average is 10 to 15%. We've been returning 23% so far by bringing the poker strategy to it, to it and making money in our follow-ons. So that's our edge. Figure out whatever your edge is, but accept that, you know, the odds are most of your two thirds of your deals will fail. <laughs> One third of your deals will give you three X and one in 25 will be a 10 X or better. That's your math. Figure out how you will make money given that math for the deals you invest in. Thank you for that insight. Kamal, for people who are interested in reaching out to you or maybe catching a cup of coffee with you, what would be the best point of contact? So our website is easy to find, loyal.vc. Um, depends what your interest is, uh, uh, but you can certainly write to invest at loyal.vc. I do do um, occasional one-on-one -on -one meetings with people. We don't need uh, VC deals. We've got our sourcing set up, unless someone is a Founder Institute or an INSEAD graduate, in, in which case, please reach out because that's who we fund. 
Uh, but if you don't fit one of those two categories, we really don't need companies, which I know is unusual for a VC, but it's how we work. Um, we do take good advisors. So if you've got experience and would like to help entrepreneurial companies, reach out. But yeah, all of the above, invest at loyal.vc or advisors at loyal.vc are the two best places for investors and advisors to reach out to us. Um, and look, if you're, uh, I'm always happy to, to sort of share things. I do mentoring with Founder Institute. I take calls from people from INSEAD. Um, so I do a lot of mentoring of entrepreneurs as it is already. Always happy to have a chance to speak though and share whatever experience I have, which is useful to others. Kamal, it was a pleasure having you on Geeks of the Valley and thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you.